So crises don't always move at the speed of light. You know, sometimes they do, but sometimes there is a little flare up and then a pause and then a little flare up and then another little pause and then a whole bunch of flare ups and it gets, and it gets really bad. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. I do know that the system as we have it is wildly unstable and it's unstable both in a financial sense um, and in a bigger sort of societal and policy driven stance. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. The systems that run our economy are only as good as the people running them. With hot inflation, the recent debt ceiling standoff, bank failures, and scandals like FTX, it's understandable to wonder if we couldn't find better leaders than the ones we currently have in place. Which is why we're very fortunate to have Bethany McLean join us on the program today. A Slate columnist and contributing editor for Vanity Fair, Bethany worked for 13 years as, as editor-at-large at Fortune, where she and fellow reporter Peter Elkind exposed the Enron scandal. She is also the nationally best-selling co-author of The Smartest Guys in the Room and All the Devils Are Here, books that were exposés that dug deep into the global financial crisis and business ethics, which make her a perfect expert for today's topic on leadership. Bethany, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, Bethany, um, really appreciate you joining. I know you are fresh off the efforts of getting a new book uh, off to the publisher. Congratulations. I know that's a Herculean amount of work these days. Um, a lot of questions here for you. If we can, I'd just like to start with the general one I like to ask all my guests at the beginning of these discussions. What's your current assessment of today's economy and financial markets? Well, it's a fascinating question because I think you could argue just about anything you want to argue, right? <laughs> I mean, we sit on the precipice of of and uh, uh, or more maybe a a, a a a water. It could go either way. Um, uh, you could make a case that that things uh, things are pretty good. First earnings came in better than people were expecting them to be. It looks like the Fed is beginning to get inflation under control. Maybe. Maybe we'll get that soft landing where the Fed gets inflation under control and we don't um, slump into into a recession. Um, the gap in income has closed for the first time in a long, long, long time. You have those at the bottom end of, end of the spectrum doing really well and oh, well, doing really well, doing better than than they have in a long time relative to those at the top. And you have um, job uh, plenty of jobs. So you could, you could make a really, you could make a really bullish argument for the, for the U S you could also make a really bearish case <laughs> is that corporations have been able to raise profits in the face of inflation. And that's, that's to some degree, um, 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 leading to the, to the, to the good results that we are indeed headed into a recession, that the inflation numbers still aren't great. And the fed has missed the call on inflation all along. Um, and that the, and that as the pandemic, um, era fades that these gains that we've seen for people at the bottom end of the of the income distribution are are going to evaporate if we head into a recession and layoffs continue. So I I, I don't know. Basically, I could but I but I could make an argument either way. Okay, uh, if I could sum up, then it sounds like you said you're saying we're we're sort of at a juncture point here, and uh, I guess intimating we'll find out you know, at some point here, which which way we go down, the, the, the sunnier route or the darker route? Uh -huh. I think so. I think um, I had said precipice, but that's the wrong word. What I'm really trying to think of is sort of like the continental divide. Um, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're big swaths of poss possibilities on either side of this this line that we're perched on right now, or this divide All that right. we're right now. So we'll, we'll dig into a few of those. Um, uh, but, but, just to start here, you know, your, your work largely centers around um, the people who are running our systems, whether it's the financial system, the banking system. I know your new book uh, deals with sort of the response to the pandemic and whatnot. Um, and as I said in the intro, you know, any system is really only as good at the end of the day as the people who are running it. And, um, you know, you've done what I would sort of consider to be sort of exposés you know, in the past where, you know, you've, you've revealed that, that a lot of times the, the, the smartest guys in the room you know, weren't necessarily the smartest guys in the room. Um, and I'm curious, um, you know, uh, at a high level here, um, would you say, and I don't 
maybe I'll deliberately use extreme words just to to uh, give you something to react to. But would you say that we have sort of a crisis of leadership today in terms of, um, you know, the has the system gotten to a, a place where it has become so captured that it is largely being run by the folks running the system for the benefit of those at the top and kind of the corporate cartels and whatnot more so than the people. And, and sort of that's why we keep getting surprised with, you know, all the excesses that led to the global financial crisis or, um, you know, all of a sudden, we, we a really strong looking bank like Silicon Valley Bank all of a sudden goes under in a matter of 48 hours. And we realize there was a ton of rot there and and, and poor risk management uh, processes that, that apparently nobody saw coming. Right. Um, so would you say that we are at a point right now where where, you know, our leadership is is failing us and, and maybe perhaps we need you know some pretty substantial reforms or am I overstating things here? I think you you might be overstating things. I don't think it's it's that dire. I think there are a lot of good people out there who are well intentioned. I do think we've reached this moment in capitalism, and for as much as we all not we all, but for as much as there's this very American belief in the glories of the free market, there's really no such thing, right? Any market is dependent on the rules that are set down, and the problem with a capitalist society where money speaks power is that increasingly the rules are weighted toward those who are in power or those who know how to how to write the rules so that they can continue to 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 make money and then people turn around and say ah it's the free market except it isn't you know the financial crisis is is the global financial crisis of 2008 is 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 example number one right the the financial system got got bailed out um in in the end and ordinary homeowners uh, did not and so that's mm -hmm. just that's and that has caused i think a lot of cynicism in 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 american life i think about the financial crisis as being primarily all these years later a societal crisis rather than a financial crisis in the sense that we fixed the financial part of it by throwing lots of money at it but but it left this growing cynicism about the way the world works, to your point. And, right. and, and sorry to interrupt, but it also left a wide uh, and for a long while accelerating wealth gap, too, yes. where that money we threw at it didn't go evenly into people's pockets. Yeah. Right. And precisely. And that's because the, of the Fed's response to the financial crisis, not just because of the Fed's response to the financial crisis, but the Fed's ongoing response over that next decade, which was to keep interest rates super low, which, of course, inflates asset prices and the inflation in asset prices primarily benefits the wealthy. Um, so so so. So that it, and, and I don't think the Fed, by the way, was doing it to make the wealthy wealthier. I think the Fed was trying to fix unemployment. So I think the Fed was basically well intentioned. It's just that the only medicine they had happened to have a very deleterious um, um, side effect. But I, so I do. I worry. I worry a lot about that. I worry a lot about the way the rules are being set and the the forces that that are setting those rules. I think they are less the specific people in power than they are kind of the big shadowy forces out there mm -hmm. that often make things that often make things happen behind the scenes that 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 we don't really see. And then I think the other side of it that I that I worry about is is all of us. And maybe, you know, there's an argument when you look back to the very start of America and the amount of anger and you know, I mean civil war, for heaven's sakes, that our divides today, perhaps to say we're more divided than we've ever been is a little bit of an overstatement. But mm -hmm. but, but nonetheless, we are all forgetting how to listen to each other. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe we never knew. But it, it that makes it also really hard for people to have it makes it really hard for people to have any power when we're all susceptible to whatever narrative being put forward by by the people in power that that divides us rather than unites us. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, just to dig on this a little bit, um, because it, 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 I, I sort of got more affirmation from your answer <laughs> than, than maybe intended. But even even it, when I'm trying to be positive, I can't be positive. <laughs> yeah. And just to clarify, too, like my question wasn't like, is there a group of mustache twirlers that are, you know, planning, you know, world domination at the expense of everybody else? But it's I, I sort of use that term captured, right, which you sort of said yourself that um, as money gets concentrated, the, po the pools that it concentrates in, they then use that money to continue to write the rules to their ongoing advantage, right? And it just becomes an increasingly sort of unfair system as, as those who 
just sort of human nature. It's our human nature is to try to advance our own interests, right? Where you end up with either, you know, the top 1% or whether it's the, the corporations that have, you know, in many cases, this is my words, you don't have to agree with them, but I feel like it's hard to look at a sector of the economy now that doesn't kind of operate like a cartel, you know, with a few big companies at the top who are then investing in regulations and whatnot to increase the moat between them and any potential other additional competition and whatnot. Um, yeah, I... And if you, if you sort of just run that mental model in your head, you're like, okay, well, at some point that kind of generally hits some sort of breaking point where, where at some point societally, maybe it's because of the wealth divide or whatnot, but where people may stand up and just say, hey, this isn't working for me anymore. We need to have some pretty big restructuring going on here yet. Don't necessarily say we're there quite yet, but it, it seems to be the trajectory from my perspective. And given that you kind of spend your career looking at people at the top, you know, I mean, if there's optimism and hope for, for, for kind of self-reform in these, you know, in these areas, great. I'd, I'd love for it. But, you know, as I, I listed a whole bunch of things at the beginning, you know, we had, again, I'm not saying it, it's done intentionally. It's probably done with the best of intentions, but but misguided in application. You know, we've had monetary policy that I think in retrospect clearly ran hot for too long or, or too loose for too long. And then we got this massive inflation and we're trying to get that genie back in the bottle. And there's all the collateral damage that that has created as we've had to hike interest rates faster, you know, in a shorter period of time than we ever have before. We had the, you know, we've got the drama with the debt ceiling standoff and the debt is a massive problem that we honestly just keep hand kicking. Like we're not even really dealing with it. We had the bank failure. Like we're just sort of seeing all these, um, at least from my perspective, instances where, um, you know, our leaders are, are, are driving things to these, I guess I'll call them breaking points or failure points or whatnot. And, um, uh, I don't know. Like I said, you you know these people better than I do. do is there hope that we're going to get, you know, a new generation of better people running the system better, or are we just going to run till it really breaks and then people look at the rubble and say, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this going forward? I suspect generally the latter, right? Things have to get to a breaking point before there's before there's change. And you're right. I think that is worrisome. And I think about this loosely in, in two ways. There are a whole set of people for whom capitalism is not working. And it, it did weirdly enough, and to the to the uh, absolute um, contrary of the predictions that most economists had, that the pandemic was going to leave those at the bottom end of the income distribution worse off than they ever were. And those were certainly the numbers in the immediate immediate aftermath of COVID hitting. But that's actually not what's happened. Uh, there's a lot of analysis showing that those at the bottom end of the income spectrum have done better than than, than they have in decades uh, in, the, in the last couple of years. And a tight labor market has certainly helped that. And so there's 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 some, the response to the pandemic is not 100% of a response of benefiting the wealthy at, at, at the expense of the less wealthy. Yet at the same time, inflation takes a bite out of those at, at the bottom end far more than it does those at the top end. It's almost right. as if different sets of inflation numbers, right? I always kind of laugh when I see the headline inflation number because I think inflation is personal, right? It depends on your budget. If you're sending your child to college, then the, the rising cost of higher education is hugely inflationary for you. If you're renting, the rising cost of rent is hugely inflationary. If a good portion of your of your of your income goes to milk and eggs and food, other food and gasoline, then the current environment has been has been really hard. So they're just and that unfortunately does in general hit people at the bottom end of the income distribution more. And so it does seem when you look there have been a few things that have gone right, as I mentioned, but it does seem that most of the decisions we seem to make hurt the small and the less well off and benefit the big. And I don't I don't know why that happens time time and time again, but you can even look at the recent banking crisis um, as, as more evidence of that. And then I think the real instability in society always comes from the slightly less well off who start feeling that they don't have the opportunities um, that the really, really well off do. Mm -hmm. And so while nobody is crying for the top, you know, 99.9% or the top or the 99% or the 90th from the 99th percent, those people sometimes are crying for themselves. And I worry about that, that the instability that comes there, because it usually is 
those one layer down who foment instability, who have the time to start plotting a revolution because they think that they and their children should be entitled to what the 0.1% has. And increasingly in American life, that's that's not true, right? There are places that aren't livable. There's education that kids can't have. There are all sorts of things. And so I, I worry about those two sources of instability, the people for whom capitalism really isn't working and the people who comparatively feal that capitalism isn't working for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Explain that to you. It totally does. And, I, and uh, we've talked about this a bit on the program before, but I'd love to dig into it with you a little bit here, which is, you know, when you when you talk about, you know, let's talk about the bottom 90%, right? The, the folks that aren't close to the brass ring these days. Um, and it, it's sort of asymptotic, right? I mean, the closer you get to that top 1%, your, your wealth just goes through the roof. Um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of... Um, uh, movement towards sort of the democratic socialism side of things. And I get it, you know, especially I'm a, I'm a parent, right? I've got a child in their twenties, a child in their teens. Um, you know, I, I get the general sense that younger generations feel right now of, Hey, I'm, I'm coming of age in a world where the opportunities are, as they perceive them diminished from what previous generations had, Things are super unaffordable, um, you know, especially the the key elements of the American dream: the cost of education, the cost of housing, that type of thing. Um, and so there's almost of a little bit of a sense of defeatism, and there's a sense of like, look, yeah, all right, you guys tell me socialism's bad, but what we have right now isn't working out so great for me either. And I may as well vote for the guy who's promising me some free stuff along the way, even if I'm going to get screwed in the end, no matter which path we take. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to make this about, uh, you know, the evils of socialism versus capitalism or whatnot, but but I can definitely see that pull, right, from younger generations saying, almost like, I'm, we're kind of willing to throw out the rule book of how, you, you know, American society has been run, because it's just not working for us anymore. And I, I do think that, you know, we could have some pretty large political instability at some point as that generation really comes of age and starts voting if things if prospects for them don't start looking better you're yeah. sort of nodding as i'm saying all this so i'd love to hear your thoughts i totally agree with that and i think that it is it is worrisome. I'm pretty firmly, at least still, I'm always open to changing my mind, but I'm pretty firmly in the camp that capitalism is, is the best model out there with the, you know, the famous words of Winston Churchill, right? As he, he said it about democracy, but we could say it about capitalism too. It's the worst possible way to, to run the economy, except for everything else that's ever been tried. Right. But back to my point that I be, began with, you know, capitalism is not, capitalism and rabid free markets are, are two different they're they're related but 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 they're different and there really isn't any such thing as as a free market i mean if you think about even the inst the, the the existence of a limited liability corporation right that's granted by government granted by society so that people can run a business without being worried about how it affects their personal liability. That's a gift from society and the government to private enterprise. It's it's a rule. Same it's as rule. all same as all the rules dictating what happens in bankruptcy, right? They're rules. That and it's bankruptcy court and rules that make it possible for much of we, what we think of as the free market to function. Th those those are rules. So the question to me about capitalism is how we set the rules in a way that in a way that makes sense for for, for the most people. And that's what I think we're we're failing to do because people have this in some cases because people have this ideological belief that the that the free market is just the, the the free market without looking at the rules and the structures underpinning it and how and how those things are set up and whether they're set up to benefit the few or set up to ben benefit the many and I, th I think you know an example of that an example of th how things have evolved is the pretty monomaniacal focus on the bottom line and the short-term bottom line I'm mm -hmm. willing, I'm willing to I'm willing to make the argument that a long-term bottom line could be aligned with society's interests, but a short-term bottom line is very clearly not. And I think people see that and that's and it's really problematic. And we've been talking about the dangers of short-termism, my goodness, since at least the days of Enron. I remember talking to people about it at all these conferences and on these shows. And so people were probably talking about it be before I knew it. And it doesn't change. We just get more and more short-term oriented. 
And I think I, I think that's that that's problematic because we can see the many ways in which being short term oriented people can make fortunes doing things that are clearly bad for the majority of of, of society. And that's you see that happening, um, whether in the subprime crisis where a lot of people got out with a lot of money before the proverbial um, four letter word hit the fan, um, or you can see it happening in, in, in many other areas. And I, that that worries me. And then there is this also broader breakdown, I think, of morality that used to govern the system. And I don't know how we get it back because I, I do, I don't believe in rules dictating everything about human society. And the best example I can come up with of that is what happened with Martin Shakrali and then the pharmaceutical company Valiant, both of whom, you know, Martin came decided he could raise the price on this drug 400% or whatever the number was, because what was to stop him? It wasn't illegal. And then Valiant started doing the same thing. And then all these companies were founded to buy up existing drugs that people needed and raise the price to whatever they possibly could. And you know, it wasn't illegal, but that never happened before. Why didn't that happen before? Because people wouldn't do it because they they would look at it and say, ew, I'm not making my money that way. That's You didn't need a law to prevent it from happening. It just companies didn't do it. There was until, a social constraint. Yeah, was a social constraint and, until it wasn't. And I, I look at that example and I worry more broadly about the breakdown in social constraints and what that means for the future of capitalism, because some part of some part of it has to be self-regulating based on social constraints. It can't be it can't be regulated entirely by by rules and regulations. It has to be I won't do that because because I wouldn't do that because it's not the right thing to do. And in a society that no longer seems to believe that, what what happens? So super interesting, and and this isn't where I was expecting to go in the discussion, but let's let's stay here for a minute. So th this is reminiscent of a conversation I had on this program a few weeks ago with with uh, Charles Hugh Smith, where he he basically made the statement. He said we we actually have really good institutions for dealing with the problems that we face right now. We're just not using them well. And 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 basically, what he sort of deconstructed it to is he said, look, we have. We have uh, the public, we have the state, uh, and then we have the, the the market, right? And he said they're actually all really good for uh, you know putting in place you know the, the the conditions we we want and need to you know solve or solve issues or go after opportunities, but we have to be using them the right way. And the way that we sort of boil it down is is it's the public's job to basically set the values. Right, it's to put into place the leaders that say, "Look, this this is this is what we value as a society." Right, and then your job as the state is to to put in the rules for how we're going to sort of enforce society's values. But but then kind of you know set the parameters, but then then just be a ref, right? Mm -hmm. And then the market is within the set parameters. It's to play the game and it's to find the solutions, right? But 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 kept in check, you know, enough by whatever the 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 values that the public has set, you know, to to, to drive the game. And that way you hopefully don't have the you know, I the price that. gouging of the type that you were talking about, right? And hopefully you don't have too intrusive a government, right? Where they they set the minimum amount of rules to support the values and then they shift just to being a ref to make sure that no bad actors are breaking the rules too much, right? And kind of in each one of those cases, we don't really have a public, this is my opinion, you don't have to share it, we don't really have a public that's um, perhaps uh, grabbing the agency they need to, to really hold, one, to be clear on what their values are, because as you said, this is one of the more divided times in, in American history. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of dynasties and big money and still in, in 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 politics and i don't think we as a public have have really you know been clear on what we want and and, and demanded that the politics shift to to account for that you know, again you don't need to share that opinion i think we have a lot of uh excessive government intervention and in a lot of different things and you know we could start with all the endless qe programs and stuff that have been going on but but those are just one of many examples and then, of course, we have a lot of abuses that are going on in this kind of corporate cartel-like uh, uh, structure that we have in the markets right now. So the, 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 the fundamental point being is, is we have good institutions or good machinery in place. We're just not using it in the way that we could and maybe should be to 
writing how we want things to go. You're nodding as I'm saying this, but I don't want to imply that that's acceptance of what I'm saying. So let me give you a chance to respond. Well, I love the framework. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about things. And I like the idea of the tripod, um, broadly speaking. I think, I think, I think that's, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I agree, you know, the more, the, the more you need a lot of rules and regulations when it isn't clear, because you need the rules and regulations to try to draw to try to cross, dot every i and cross every t when it's when the broader frameworks aren't 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 clear and so i but i the only thing i don't like about that is that i'm not it's diffuse in terms of how to fix it mm -hmm. I, I, maybe we all have to be educated differently so that people understand this is this is our job in this thing called a functioning democracy that with a capitalist economic system if this is how we want it to be this is the job we have to take and there has I to mean, be a, I, I would be for that you, you don't have to but i, I, I would, would be, be for that, that. <laughs> there has to be then there has to be agreement on the part of of government and there has to be agreement on the part of on the part of business that that this is that this is the way it works that there isn't such a thing as an unfettered free market that there are rules and norms and values that we all we all live by to make this thing work and i think too often i think business doesn't really get that their response to the challenges with capitalism is you people who don't appreciate what you have instead of huh what what can we do to stabilize the system so that we get to keep making the money at least some degree of the money we make so that this this works for everybody and we don't have something that blows up on all of us and i think about that I think it's most profound in the area of healthcare, where you look at the pharmaceutical price gouging that I had mentioned, and then you look at the hospital system and the way it functions, and some of the scandals of recent years, like surprise billing, where people would go to an emergency room and not realize their ER doctor didn't take their insurance that the hospital did and get stuck with, you know, multiple, it, it doesn't take much of that to break down the faith in, in, in our system. And I wish the people doing that understood the broader consequences of, 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 of what they did. And that eventually it may not rebound on them, but it's for sure going to rebound on, 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 on society at large if a lot of people lose faith in our, in our system. Yeah. And of course that's, you know, that's the blindness of the folks that have the advantage right now, right? Is if you just keep maniacally continuing to slant the field your advantage at some point the majority and there's a lot more of them than you you know wakes up one day and says we're not taking this anymore right and that's when you get either social violence or you get you know wealth redistributive taxes or whatever right yeah um, yeah this um just, you know, okay. on that note i have a um I do a podcast with a guy named Luigi Singalis, who's a professor at the University of Chicago. And a great we had, podcast. thank you. And we had an economist named David Autor, who's an MIT economist on our on our show recently. And he made the point, which I found really profound, that if you structure labor markets appropriately, then you don't have to have redistribution. So when and if you pay for things appropriately on the front end, then you don't have to have redistribution on the back end. And so one way of thinking about that is we all want cheap goods, right? But then we have to redist redistribute because the people who work at Walmart and Amazon and where aren't, aren't making enough of a living wage in order to cover their expenses. So wouldn't you rather just pay a, a better price for the thing that you're buying so that the labor markets work appropriately? Because then people have the dignity of work and you don't have, have to have as much redistribution on the back end. And I thought, oh, that makes all the sense in the world to me that, that labor markets really are the key to fixing capitalism. Because if you get labor markets working right and people can get a job where they can earn a living wage, you, you, you fix a lot of this. And I don't, it, it bothers me. I don't really, I couldn't walk you through the intellectual underpinning for why capitalism isn't working that way anymore. I mean, I think it's a lot of short-term shareholder value um, oriented, oriented decisions but it's that's but it's problematic because you would you would like to believe that capitalism working efficiently would make sure that everybody up and down the chain had the opportunity to to make a living to make a living but but as we can all see right now that's getting that is breaking down and uh i i think there are problems on both sides right which is the short-term bottom line ism that you're talking about but also, I think there's lots of issues with government. Like, like, and, and I've been writing about this long before just the the recent current AI, you know, mania that's going on, where um, we have been providing a, a massive perverse incentive, or what I call a mal incentive, 
uh, to businesses to find ways to replace human capital because we are making the cost of employing humans prohibitively expensive for em employers. Um, you know, with um, everything from you know mandated increases in you know minimum wage, which in you know certain states you know it almost went up by like fifty percent in the matter of a year or two in certain places where you know OSHA requirements and and healthcare costs and all, all kinds of things and not that you don't need to have safety in healthcare but um you know we we basically said look um uh it's getting harder and are more and more expensive uh to to hire a person and with training and legal risks and just all sorts of things and the um technological solutions for replacing them are getting cheaper and cheaper and up until quite recently we're making debt super cheap to take on. So there was just this massive incentive to either outsource or automate. And you know, we start then hollowing out, um, particularly this was hitting before AI, it was this was hitting the lower end of, of the, the wage scale. So we were kind of like dramatically hollowing out the onboarding process for yeah. people entering the workforce. Um, and so, you know, labor's just been getting, you know, I think a, 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 the shorter and shorter end of the stick here. Um, but, but, you know, to our point here, it's it's been both because of what's been going on 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 the corporate short term side, but also a lot of you know policy that's been going on. So to your point, like we sort of need a reevaluation or at least a smarter evaluation. I always kind of go back to Charlie Munger's talk about like show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome, right? If you can if you can design a system and provide the right incentives, then the system should hopefully just play out and find the optimal solution. Right. But yeah. it seems like we're kind of mucking up the design and we're putting perverse incentives in play at the same time. Yeah, I agree with that. And it is it is really problematic because if someone doesn't get on the work path at a pretty early stage in their life, they're they're never going to. They're going to miss out on developing the skills that that you need. And so but if you are going to create a class of people that doesn't work, then you have to be prepared that that's that's never going to change because it's really difficult to have somebody who doesn't work for a decade and get them back on the on, on the path toward work. Yeah. I think the research also shows that it's pretty difficult for their kids as well. So I, I speaking of just government incentives, if we are through a I mean there's there's an interesting parallel between what happened with China and outsourcing so 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 much and taking manufacturing jobs away from the US and what might happen with AI. And most economists miss the the China shock because people didn't want to see it. Globalization was just supposed to make things cheaper. It was supposed to benefit everybody. And now at least some economists, including Autor, look back and say, oh, this was really really disruptive to swaths of the economy in a way that was not just bad for people, it was bad for their children. And if we're going to do that again with AI and wipe out swaths of the economy, we have to be really prepared for the social consequences of that. And it's not fixable through through universal basic income. It's That's a salve that might, that might uh, ameliorate some of the really terrible effects. But it it doesn't it doesn't fix the problem and so i i and i i worry like you that we're not we're not even capable of of thinking about that yeah all right well like i said you were probably not expecting the conversation to go in this direction <laughs> i wasn't really either T two last things before we we get to what i did want to talk to you about um which was the state of the banking system because i know that you've been covering that of late um uh so you 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 talked about you know uh some of these bad actors that sort of screlly like you know kind of made out like bandits with with big short term as a short short termerism uh, on the bottom line, um, and it's and how we haven't held them to account. And I'm sure you and I can create a long list. But as you were talking, I was thinking about Angela Mozillo, right? And uh, it's a name we just haven't heard for a long time. But but am I correct in thinking that that guy really did kind of skate? Um. I think he he did. So one of the things I developed a lot more, I have so much less of a um, black and white view of human nature than than I once did. In some ways, I'm I'm am I sympathetic to him? I mean, he he did he did his company did propagate bad subprime loans all over the country in a desperate effort to keep up with other subprime lenders and make sure that countrywide didn't lose market share. But it was less driven by let me do a bad thing in order to make my money. Um, and that's usually not the way things work. And it was much more 
this is short term in some ways. This is what's happening. If I don't keep up with these bad subprime lenders and make these loans, then countrywide is no longer going to be relevant. And my investors and board of directors are going to say, Angelo, you no longer have a job because you're not making these profits that are there to be made by making these by making these loans. And that's what led countrywide down down that path, really. And then there's another aspect to this too, which is the reason that he was not prosecuted criminally and got off pretty lightly civilly, is that the argument was always, well, Countrywide actually disclosed all of this in their in their financial statements. There weren't really any secrets. When everybody said, oh, oh my goodness, these emails from Angelo Mozilla talking about Countrywide's credit quality, he knew. Well, of course he knew. It was it was, it was right there in their financial statements. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm 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 a little I'm a little mixed on that that argument because we but 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 it for sure holds up in court and there's another level to this which is that that I'm not so sympathetic to which is once again the way our system works right it serves the laws serve to insulate those at the top of a company because they can say I relied on my lawyers I relied on my accountants I relied on my underlings and you can't prosecute them even if they directly benefited from the behavior of those underneath them and that is the case with Mozilla he made a lot of money from countrywide's move into subprime loans which ended up being really bad for the country and really bad for some of his employees I think some of them did face criminal charges or lost their jobs or whatever else. But Mozilla, who sits at the top, gets to be protected. And it's another example of what we were talking about at the beginning, how our entire system is geared to deliver wealth to those at the top while insulating them from responsibility for their actions. And I have no problem with somebody who creates a business making a lot of money. I think that's the way it's supposed to work. When the business provide, creates jobs and creates products that really want, and when that person ends up with the responsibility if things don't work. What I don't like is our modern system where it doesn't really have to create many jobs. I'm not even sure it has to create a product that people want. And when, once again, the four-letter word hits the fan, the person gets to keep the money and walk away from the responsibility. That seems screwed up to me. All right. Well, that's exactly why I raised him. So I think you you just laid that out very well. And, and perhaps that might be a good segue um, into talking about the banking system here. We've had uh, three of the four largest bank failures in the U.S. in the past two, two and a half months or so. Um, so uh, a couple of questions for you. I'm trying to figure out where to go. Um, uh, I, I do want to talk about the leadership of Silicon Valley Bank. And what's interesting is, is I've now actually just very recently in the headlines seen some discussion that maybe there might be some sort of clawback efforts going on here because the executives there did take out a fair amount of pay in the year plus leading up to um, the surprise failure of Silicon Valley Bank. But maybe before we talk about that specifically, what what is the current state of of the banking system? Uh, Janet Yellen even said relatively, I think just a couple of days ago, look, there may be, she called them a few more consolidations, um, but that's code for sort of like, hey, there may be a few more failures where a bank needs to be taken over going forward. Um, have we seen the worst of it or is there are there more failures ahead of us here, do you imagine? I don't know. We're in a state of um, like the eye of the storm right now or a state of um, nervous calm where people are still nervous, but the jitters are right under the surface and everybody's saying, ah, it's calm. But that doesn't really mean anything. If you remember the global financial crisis, the tremors actually first started in the fall of 2007. They might even have started earlier, actually, in early in early 2007, actually, when sub, the price of subprime mortgage-backed securities first began to, to, to plummet. And it took a good year and a half for, for the total catastrophe to arrive. So crises don't always move at the speed of light. You know, sometimes they do, but sometimes there is a little flare up and then a pause and then a little flare up and then another little pause and then a whole bunch of flare ups and it gets, and it gets really bad. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. I do know that the system as we have it is wildly unstable and it's unstable both in a financial sense um, and in a bigger sort of societal and policy driven stance. And by the first one, I, I mean that, you know, the Fed calming the panic by stepping in and guaranteeing the deposits at banks that are failing is not the way this whole deal is supposed to work, right? <laughs> just just stipulated. If that's mm-hmm. the way it has to work, then something something is going badly wrong. 
And so, it, and it's both that the Fed is taking on a larger and larger role in our economy all, all the time. Um, and it's that, that that's not sustainable. The Fed can't. I don't think the Fed, even the Fed has the firepower to guarantee, to guarantee deposits across the entire banking system. And the modern banking system doesn't work the way the old one does. Silicon Valley Bank is proof positive of that. And what I mean by that is that in the old days, everybody believed deposits were stable. That was your stable source of funding. And it was stable if it was business deposits because you had relationships with these people and they weren't just going to yank their money all at once. Well, now guess what? Luigi actually has done some research with a colleague showing that it looks like consumer deposits at banks that have uh, where you can electronically move your money really easily are mm -hmm. less stable. Because if you're at a, if your deposits are at a bank earning nothing and you can move them to a money market fund and earn five percent, it's easy today to do that. So that makes consumer that makes consumer deposits less stable. And a Silicon Valley bank shows business deposits aren't that stable either, right? One little whisper and the and the herd starts to move, and then and then the herd stampedes. So the old rules of banking clearly don't apply, which is why I say the system is unstable financially. But I think it's also unstable more broadly because what we've done every time a crisis is hit is make the big bigger, right? We did mm -hmm. it in the global financial crisis and we're doing it now. And I have, I have, I, I think I respect Jamie Dimon more than about any business leader out there. If you had to have somebody running a large swath of the of the country's um, banking system, you'd want it to be Jamie Dimon. But do you want somebody running a large swath of the country's banking system? I'm, I'm not sure. It flies in the face of everything we've always said of what our supposed policy is. And our supposed policy is small banks and small businesses. And if you don't have small banks anymore, then at some point you don't have small businesses anymore because a JP Morgan Chase is not going to make a $50,000 loan to the local carpentry store, the local you know hardware store. And so what do we want as a country? Do we want small banks and small businesses or do we want everything to be dominated by the big? And nobody seems to be willing to reckon with everything we do to bail out an unstable system makes the big bigger at the expense of the small. Is 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 that where we're going? Is that where we want to go? I, maybe you can make an argument that that's where we should go. I don't think so. But at least let's make that argument instead of just doing it and then living with the consequences. Right. And I wonder if this isn't yet another example of what we talked about at the very beginning of those who have increasingly captured the system discontinuing to centralize their advantage more and more, right? So too big to fail becomes too bigger to failer, right? Uh, just going through the pandemic, and this was happening well before the pandemic, where uh, banking aside for a second, you had, you know, the Amazons and the Walmarts and these big behemoths beginning just to eat up, you know, opportunity from small business. And then we had the pandemic hit where we shut down the non-essential parts of the economy, which were all the small businesses, and we let these guys basically get all of the the commerce. Um, so, to your point, like that's the rule book we're playing by right now, right? We didn't have a discussion about it. We you know we're not really debating is that a destination we want to end up at, where everything is mega concentrated at the end. So, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, and per point, that's that's exactly what happened in the pandemic, and then it got even worse with supply chain snarls and with inflation because that, of course, both of those have hurt small businesses far more than they've hurt large businesses. You know, large businesses could get space on the on the container ships, and small businesses couldn't. And large businesses are hurt by the cost by inflation, but not as much as small businesses are. So every single thing seems to conspire against the small, and I. I I, I just, I, I just, if, 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 again, if we were doing that as a deliberate matter of policy, okay, let's, let's talk about what the costs of that are, but it doesn't seem that we are. It seems that it's just what's easiest in, in the current economy. And then as you and I have been talking about, why is that what's easiest? Why is our system set up so that that seems to be the only way out? I, I don't know. Right. And going back to our early discussion about um, hollowing out of employment, right? I mean, the small businesses are the vast majority of the jobs providers, right? Yeah. So yeah. as they get hollowed out, you know, there's a lot less opportunity per capita uh, for people out there to find jobs, right? Well, so this is, this is not my idea. It came from a really smart person I was talking to recently, but he made the point that we have always relied on small business to lead us out of a recession because it is small businesses that create most, most of the jobs. So if we're 
if we are heading into a recession and we're trying to rely again on small business to lead us out at the very time where we're stopping the flow of credit to small businesses because small banks are terrified to extend loans for fear that they're going to have a run. Um, what, what, what does that mean for, for, for our economy? And again, if, if we're thinking through it and we've got another solution or we've just decided small business go off and die. Uh, okay. But I don't, I don't think, I don't think we're thinking through it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's tug on that thread for a second. And I, I, I then we'll have to come back because there are a few other questions I have on, on banking for you, but um, so let, let's go into the fed, which is another area that you, you look at. Um, so, you know, the fed has, has hiked rates um, more aggressively than in history. I think when you, you look at the altitude that they've gained in the short period of time, um, talk a lot about on this program, how, um, in many ways, that's sort of like, you know, throwing somebody off a ship in the Arctic Ocean, right, where they just get this hypothermic, instant hypothermic shock, right, because their temperature has just changed so dramatically, we've just ramped up the cost of capital, right. And, um, you know, we're now hanging out above 5% right now in the Fed funds rate. Bullard today just said that uh, he thinks there could be two more rate hikes going from here. Powell has said, uh, rate cuts, not on my radar for 2023, right? Um, so, uh, and he's planning on, you know, keeping things higher for longer, right? And maybe even with Bullard, maybe even a little higher for maybe even a little longer, we're, we're going to find out. But that is a that is a, a much higher cost of capital than the economy has had to deal with in a long time, right? It's an economy that really habituated to close to Zerk, right? right. And so the question is, is, like, how long can the wheels stay on with the cost of capital this high? Um, and then, of course, we have the the bank lending uh, standards that have tightened post uh, the the bank failures we've been talking about. And Powell himself has admitted those act as additional rate hikes on top of what the Fed is already doing here. Right. So, I think that there's a big danger here that the system really starts kind of the, the gravitational pull on the system just becomes so strong, the system just has to start kind of, I don't want to use the word breaking down, but maybe some might. Um, how, how concerned or, or what do you think is likely to happen given where the cost of capital is these days? Well, I think there are a few separate arguments in here. And one is what the Fed hike, rate hikes mean in the short term and whether the economy can bear the rapid rise in rates without things without things starting to break. And I think we've seen evidence that that's that's not the case. And I just I just I just don't know. I'm not. I'm not great at predictions, and I really don't think anybody knows. I had interviewed Leo Brainerd um, in Chicago a few months back, and the Fed was, this is kind of funny, the Fed, I guess, at that point was telegraphing that it was going to stop interest rate increases, or at least slow the pace of them, because it looked at that point briefly like inflation was under control. And I'm so, so unskilled in Fed speak that I didn't even get that, which that was what she was saying when I interviewed her. It wasn't <laughs> until I read I read reporters, uh, um, uh, 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 reporters interpretation of her remarks that I was like, oh. Oh, that's what she was saying. Just <laughs> for me. I'm, I'm not skilled in Fed speak. Anyway, but so I don't think the Fed really knows, to, to be to be honest. And they're they're trying to reassert credibility and authority and reclaim expertise. And thus they've and they've lost a lot of it. And I'm 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 I so I, I I don't think anybody knows where this is going in the short term is is my point. But in the longer term, I also think there's a separate question about what is a healthy level of interest rates. I mean, yeah, rates are higher now than they've been in a really long time. And none of us, very few of us have been around in an environment of, of rising interest rates like this. But rates are really, really low by historical standards, or certainly by the standards of, of, of the 1970s, right? And isn't in some ways a 5% interest rate healthier? I mean, we all agreed that ZERP was unhealthy. It wasn't supposed to be sustainable. It wasn't supposed to be forever. But some of the very business people who complained about Federal Reserve policy and the unsustainability of ultra low interest rates in QE are now out there saying, if the Fed doesn't stop raising interest rates, it's going to break the economy. And I think, well, what's what's the right answer? Isn't it, again, important here to have a sense of where, where are we headed? Because in some ways, a 5% interest 5% interest rates are, are healthier, right? Savers can earn a return on, on their money. Right. It's, 
easier, it's easier for those living on a fixed income to be able to figure out um, how, how they're going to live. It's easier for pension plans uh, to be to 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 deliver it to deliver a, a decent return and not be so dependent on the on the whims of the stock market if you have a fixed income market that is that is that is delivering a return. So I think so I think there are two questions. What are the near-term costs to what the Fed is doing, um, um, and what else? What else might break as a result? And what's what's the right long term? What's the right long term? But the but but the first one is also complicated by the fact that you have a lot of people out there in the, in the market who thought they were really brilliant because they could invest in an era of falling interest rates and in an right. era of zero percent interest rates, and they had absolutely no clue what to do in a time of higher interest rates or in a time of rising interest rates. And that's a whole another layer of like what the hell is going to yeah. happen because. And, you and I would say that is almost everybody. You have right. a lot of you have you have a lot of what's is what's the old saying? It's not what you don't. It's not what you. It's Mark Twain, I think. It's not what you don't know that's going to hurt you. It's what you think you know that just ain't so. It's what you right? know for sure that just ain't so. Yeah. There are a lot of people out there who think they're really, really brilliant because it was really easy to make money over the last couple of decades, and they might be about to find out, or they have found out in the past year that maybe they're not as smart as they thought they were. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, so- and that, and that's appealing in some ways, but it may not be really good for all of us either. If those yeah, people- yeah. Well, and, and so that's sort of the nature of the question here, which is I, I really appreciate the point you make because I totally agree with it. Um, and Grant Williams just made this point most recently of, of the many that are, which is, hey, the problem is not 5% interest rates. The problem was the ZERP for as long as that we had it for, right? Yeah. Uh, we, created, we created this system that got habituated to fantasy, right? To basically to sort of, you know, cheap money for everyone and a Fed put where the Fed would step in and quell any issue at any point in time, right? right. So to your point, that was toxic for a lot of reasons. I've railed about it on this program where everybody, you know, you punish savers and everybody got pushed out sort of at sword point onto the pirate ship plank of having to go at the risk curve, you know, into into many cases, people were in assets they had no business being in, but they felt they had to be in them to get any kind of return, right? And uh, so, yeah, I think we could have a really interesting, healthy discussion because I don't even know, you know, it, you, what I think the ideal interest rate would be, but but it's probably much more in this territory than it is at zero percent, right? The point is, is that just living in the world that we live in, we've just taken a world that's been addicted to that, and we've, you know forced it to go a cold turkey and what's going to happen, right? And so again, how, how worried are you about making it to the end of this year if Powell sticks to his guns? What do you think the collateral damage of these higher uh, cost of capital uh, rates are going to be? I wish I had a great answer for you. I just I just don't know. There are so many people who are looking at this, and I tend to believe most of the time that the problems are not where we're looking. And so mm-hmm. because we're all thinking about this and wondering what the collateral damage might be, I tend to think it's going to be there are lots of subterranean quakes that are happening as we're speaking, and one of those is going to become the next big bad thing. But I doubt it's anything that anybody would see in advance. I mean, you even think, one of the fascinating things about the the banking crisis is that we all worried about I worried about a part of the book I've just written about is the growth in shadow banking, right? And everybody expected the problems to come from somewhere in the shadow banking system, maybe the enormous buildup in um, collateralized loan obligations that private equity companies have been using in order to do their increasingly bigger, bigger deals. I don't know, but I think we all thought that's where the problem would come. And no, the problem came in the regulated banking system. Go figure. So it 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 just that one of the danger that one of the dangerous things about being in the prediction game is that at least in the last since I've been writing about financial markets, the the thing that happens, the big bad thing that happens, is just not where anybody was looking. It never is. Yeah, it's uh, what is it? It's uh, the the bullet that kills you is the one that you didn't see coming, right? right? Right. And so I think there's a big risk that 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 something something happens, but I where where it would be, I I, I don't know. I worry a lot, and this is a slower problem. I, I worry a lot that one casualty of the Fed's interest rate increases is, is, is going to be private equity firms. And I don't worry for the private equity firms to be clear. I worry mm-hmm. for their, their investors who are a lot of the country's pension plans who are depending on the returns made by private equity funds to be able to pay their, their pensioners. Um, 
And in, in my view, and I've not seen analysis that would corroborate this 100%, it's more based on observation, but the private equity business model really shifted from the early years when it was, yes, built on debt, but also had a lot to do with making the company's operations better and leaner. And um, that was how you made your money. And it really became a game of financial engineering over the mm. last decades with rising interest rates where the game was, how do you do dividend recapitalizations and load as much money on in debt onto the, onto the backs of this company as you can in order to extract the money you need to pay your investors? In a time of rising interest rates, that game is over. And what does that mean for the returns private equity funds are able to deliver? And I've still not seen a good piece of analysis that would show the percentage of returns that have come from things like dividend analysis. But a guy named Dan Rasmussen, who's really smart, he's an XP guy himself and runs a firm named Fair Dad Capital, did analysis in American Affairs a couple of years back showing that most of the returns private equity was making came from debt. They came from adding debt. To, they didn't come from improving the business or streamlining it or from growth. They came from debt. Right. They hollowed out these companies, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. then and then oftentimes the exit would be you flip it to an IPO and you just dump or it on the unsuspecting another, public, right? Or it's a game of, uh, it's, a, it's a house of, it's a game of uh, musical chairs because it would also be you flip it to another private equity owner who then com comes up with more ways to extract more money because if interest rates are falling, then you can put more debt on, on, on the thing. Right. And what I hate, I mean, this does tie back to our, our the beginning of our conversation. What I hate about this is that what private equity firms have successfully been able to do in, in instances, whether it was attempting to get access to the CARES Act, but in other cases has been, has been to go to the government and say, but wait, our investors are all the big pension funds. And if we stumble and fall, they can't pay their pension. They can't pay they can't pay the pensions. And I hate that that's the way it works because that just, it seems so unfair that they've made private equity honchos have made fortunes for themselves. And yet now they get to say, but the, we'll take the little people down with us. And the problem is it's true. It's the same thing as the venture capitalists in the Silicon Valley bank run, right? That wasn't a bailout of Silicon Valley bank. It was a bail, bailout of the venture capital. The yeah. And they were able to go to regulators in Washington and say, but if you take us down, you're going to take down all these companies and you're going to take down all, the, all these employees. Place. So you can't do it. Got to save us, and they were right. And I, <laughs> but the, but the fact that they're right doesn't change the, the fact that I find it really really upsetting. Right. This is that privatization of gains, socialization of yes. losses that just makes the That's regular right. person just so under you know, so justifiably angry. angry. Right. Angry. And um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, gosh, I, I wish we had another hour because you've unlocked like five different uh, great topics. So I, I've had. Uh, some folks on this channel, Stephanie Pomboy, most recently, really ringing loudly the warning bell over the pension system. Um, I'm just curious, based upon your your research of the private equity world, um, how vulnerable do you see the the pension system being right now? I mean, so there's so many different shoes that to drop that I think could really hurt pensions that I almost can't list them all. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. It was horribly vulnerable even before the pandemic, and. You had, as a result, again, a, 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 um, a casualty or a consequence of Federal Reserve policy was pension funds increasingly putting money into private equity because private equity promised them these great promised touted these fantastic returns and private equity touted the ability to smooth the returns because you don't, a private equity firm doesn't have to mark down. Mark it's to market, yeah. Market, right? They can pretend for a while. And if you're running a pension plan and you don't have to go to your boss and say, we just lost 30%, you can say we lost 10% because your underlying P investment hasn't yet marked down its investments. Great. That's good for everybody and, until it's not. And so I, I, I worry a lot about that because talking about societal instability, if if you if if this crisis really does come home to roost and you have pension funds that can't pay benefits, then we've uh, 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 then we have a real problem. Um, we have a real problem with how people are going to live, how they're going to pay their bills. We have a real societal problem in terms of a breakdown of trust in the system. And so I I that that is my my biggest worry out there. Okay. Um... That's really saying something. All right. Uh, two questions that are unfair to ask you with so little time. So I'll just take your quick answer and then we'll we'll wrap things up. Um, what odds do you give us of avoiding recession in the next six you to are, 12 months? 
you are asking the wrong person. I'm trying to be better and better about saying, I really don't know, because it's easy to start making up answers. And so as part of my own discipline, I'm trying to be really clear about saying, I, I, I just don't know. I always tilt toward the pessimistic and I recognize my biases. So I would say the odds aren't good. We're going to, we're going to be in a recession, but really anybody hearing me say that should take that with a grain of salt, both because I don't know, I'm not an economist. I'm just a journalist. Um, and because my, my bias is toward the pessimistic. Okay. All right. I, you know, I was going to ask you a similar question about the markets. I think we'll probably have a similar answer. So let's, no. let's not even <laughs> worry about that. You um, uh, two lightning fast questions. Um, but I just, I'm sure people were thinking, wondering when you, you mentioned both. Um, when you said, uh, you gave some props to Jamie Dimon saying, look, if somebody were going to be running a huge swath of the banking system, he's the right guy for the job. Real quick, why? Because he's straightforward and knows how to admit weaknesses and how to manage people. And he's he's not arrogant. Um, and he he knows what he's doing. He knows how to run a business. I think the proof is in the pudding of JP Morgan's performance. Okay. And then secondly, you you mentioned the shadow banking system briefly. You gave private equity as one example of that. Um, people hear that term a lot, but they don't necessarily know what's meant by it. Could you just give a quick definition of, of how you define the shadow banking system? Sure. And I probably use the term a little bit loosely because I use it to encompass both non-banks and the actual shadow shadow banking system. But it, I think of the shadow banking system as anybody who is providing credit that it, providing bank-like credit that is that is outside of the regulated financial system, but yet is an incredibly important part of the provision of credit in our society and ends up in a crisis being under the rubric of the regulated of, of the Federal Reserve. So money market funds to me are a classic example of shadow banking because they're an incredibly important part of our system of providing credit. They're not supposed to be guaranteed by the government, but when there's a problem, it, it, both in the 2008 financial crisis and in the pandemic, the government has to step in to save money market funds. I think about the whole existence of dollar denominated debt outside the US when, when we've the Fed has had in both the 2008 financial crisis and in the pandemic, extend um, credit lines to central banks around the world because they they have to be able to extend dollar denominated debt to their um, constituents who are otherwise, otherwise everybody's going to have to start selling treasuries in order to raise cash. So it's this whole system of stuff that is not supposed to be under the purview of, of the Federal Reserve, but becomes something the Fed has to bail out when there's a crisis. Okay. So what you just described there at the, the end of your example was the euro dollar market, right? Yeah, and, and but yeah. it's more than that. It's this it is giant, more than that, but yeah. It's this giant shadowy network. I tried to start figuring it out for this book and kind of gave up because it was a rabbit hole. But it's this giant shadowy thing. This guy named David Mercatus at um, David Beckworth at the Mercatus Center has done a lot of work on it. It's this giant shadowy system of interconnections that are that are really pivotal to the functioning of the financial markets. And, All right. and, then, and then you use the term non-bank. Can you just give an example of one or two really important non-bank entities out there so folks know what you're talking about? So I would have thought of Countrywide as a, as, as a non-bank, right? A company that was in the business of providing mortgages, which is a bank-like activity. And you can argue is this shadow banking? Is what, what's the line between a non-bank and shadow banking? But a, com a company that is a huge part of the financial system um, in what it does, but it's not a regulated bank. All right, great. Thanks for entertaining me with those questions, but those are helpful for folks to, to follow what we're doing here. All right, so in wrapping up here, um, Bethany, thank you. This has been a great discussion. Like I said, it went in all sorts of corners. I didn't expect it was going to, but it's been really fascinating. Um, we've intimated a couple of times that you have just finished a book. I just want to give you a chance to just, get, just to give folks a heads up about what that book's about. And when it comes out later on in the year, we'll have you back on the program to really dive deep into its, its material. I would love that. Thank you. So it's called The Big Fail, What the Pandemic Reveals About Who America Helps and Who It Leaves Behind. And I guess broadly, it is applicable to a lot of the things we talked about today. I wrote it with Joan O'Sara, who edited The Smartest Guys in the Room and with whom I co-authored um, All the Devils Are Here. And it's really, I guess the thesis of the book is that the pandemic both exposed and exacerbated um, flaws in our society and in how capitalism is working. It didn't so much cause them as it, as it exposed them. So it's about the hospital system. It's about the influence of private equity and healthcare. It's about Federal Reserve policy. It's about supply chain 
chains and how they got squeezed in the name of short-term profits. And it is about um, lockdown policies and who they helped and who they hurt and why they were done in the absence of any scientific evidence that they actually worked. All right. Well, look, yes, Bethany, it'll make, it'll make it'll make everybody mad, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's super topical, and I know we have a lot of folks watching this video who'll be super interested in that. Um, so um, for folks that just can't wait until the book comes out and uh, would like to follow you and your work in the interim, where should they go? Um, let's see. The best place is probably at Bethany Mac 12 on Twitter. Um, you can also reach me on LinkedIn. I always I look at messages um, and see them when they come in on, on LinkedIn. Um, so, yeah, those are probably the best places. All right. Great. Um, well, look, Bethany, thanks so much. I just want to let folks uh, remind viewers, too. Um, a lot of the issues that we just talked about here, you know, uh, they make it uh, challenging and hard to navigate uh, the markets from an investing standpoint. Um, you know, we talked a lot about sort of the macro factors, but they definitely end up impacting the, the markets. Um, as usual, I'll just reiterate my, my strong feedback that you should be working, most people should be working under the guidance of a professional financial advisor in general, but certainly one that takes all the factors that Bethany and I uh, have discussed on this program into account when putting together their portfolio strategy. If you have one who's already doing that for you, great, stick with them. But if you don't, or you'd like a second opinion from one who does, consider scheduling a free consultation with the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses to set up that free consultation. Just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. Only takes a couple seconds. Again, totally free, no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a public service they offer to help people position prudently in this quite crazy mark, uh, crazy uh, investing climate that we're in right now. Um, all right, Bethany, I want to thank you so much again. This was wonderful. Folks, if you'd like Bethany to come back on this program again when her book comes out, please do us a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It's been a joy, Bethany. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.